Facebook gets into the workplace, Box finally schedules its IPO, and Google Glass changes gears. All that and more today on Crunch Week. Hey there, I'm Colleen. I'm Kyle. And I'm Alex. All right, so uh, first topic we're going to talk about is Facebook launched Facebook at Work, which is a new social platform for people to use inside companies. This is something that Ingrid London scooped that they were working on this this past summer, yes. but today, this week it finally launched. Well, my first reaction was, do not want. <laughs> I had the opposite reaction. Okay. I like... I'm glad that it's not just like a tab within normal Facebook. They separate it out, it's its own app, mm -hmm. you go there, and Facebook is good at design. And if you look at a lot of the like apps that are out there, despite like a decade of constant battling between uh, Yammer Did and Skype and all this to try and like own chat within the office, like it looks pretty Did good. Did you just say Facebook is good at design? Okay, I think I think that's the disagreement we have right there. Fundamentally, I log into Facebook now like once a week because ugh, and it's always just a complete cluttered mess. It's full of ads. I don't know what's going on. The news feed's poorly designed. My profile is gross now. Maybe that's much of my face, but like I, I just when I think about that company that's built this product that I no longer want to use and it's gotten worse over time, I don't want to say ah yes, I'll put my entire business operation on that. That's where we'll communicate. It'll be great. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with Kyle though. I was actually yeah. pretty excited about this. I thought that it was probably the most promising. You you know, internally developed Facebook product that we've seen from Facebook in, in years, in my opinion. Uh, they've acquired a lot of great products, but their internal launches sometimes haven't made that much sense. I thought that this looked really promising. But yeah, I don't know that the uptake is really going to work out. I mean, so many workplaces out there already ban Facebook. And right. Facebook has kind of seen the public perception of Facebook as something that could be bad for your career. You know, you have a drunk college photo on Facebook and that could like ruin your chances of getting a job or something. I think that people don't really put the two together. Okay, so you're saying Facebook at work is not the new Facebook home. What was Facebook home? Facebook <laughs> it was the Android launch. It was Android, on top of right. It. right. And, it, and it was right. an epic fail. The Facebook so, phone, right. I don't know. The way I see it is that by splitting it out into a separate app, they get to like throw away their legacy issues. And for the last year, you know, at F8 last year, they announced like all these features where they're like working on separating out like being able to log in with Facebook and it knows who you are, but doesn't bring your data with you. Uh, and I think that they're right, getting much right. better at that. And like, I think that adopting it will be easier than like moving to a whole new system because hey everyone you just sign in and like it'll be ready to go assuming they haven't completely blocked like the surface via some like IT department thing right like it's going to be a smooth uptake curve for those who are willing to experiment and the like the social like uh, problem like that might be an issue but from like a technical standpoint like they've figured out how to not bring those things. So you put up against Slack or Convo or even Yammer as, as, as a probably superior product. Well, I mean, Convo is straight up a Facebook interface knockoff yeah. that has worse stability and is slow and has weird interface things where it's like, read more, and instead of expanding down, yeah. it opens a new tab within your tab. But its mobile app is so great. Sorry, it's not. That was, oh, okay. that was sarcasm. I thought, I thought you Total were sorry. serious for a second. Yeah, I no, really no, confused. the mobile app's abysmal. But. Yeah, yeah, I think, but I think that, you know, uh, there are other products out there, too. I mean, we use Convo internally here, so we all have strong opinions on Convo, but Just I think that, bit. obviously, the clear leader in this space, or at least the ascending leader in this space, is Slack. Uh, I don't know if this is if Facebook at work is really going to push Slack off of its game. I mean, it might just bring more attention to workplace chat apps in general, and so Slack and HipChat and Yammer and you know, doesn't Campfire. Salesforce have one? It's called like um, Chatter or something. Anyway, That's, there are a lot of these wow. things so out there. The thing with Slack is from like a fundamental like how it's built up. Like we all say like, oh, if only we had threaded conversations. But like at its base, it's an IRC chat room with a lot of nifty tools for like always being aware of any documents you drop in or links, like being able to quickly get back to them. Precisely. And like that doesn't work well with also adding like threaded conversations on top of it. Is it it's two different e paradigms. Is it an either or thing? Because Convo is not like that. It's just threaded. Yeah. Um, and I feel like we always bitch and moan about what we don't have, but maybe the grass isn't greener on the other side at all. Maybe we have to have threaded over IRC. I don't know. I think the good news here altogether is that maybe email as a thing is waning in its popularity as being the default way that we're going to communicate at work because I think everyone complains about email at work and email inboxes are a mess and you know reply alls all the time it's just it's just a mess so so I think it's good that Facebook is turning its attention to this space but no. let's move on okay uh, box IPO they finally priced their initial public offering box is going to go public yes soon 
so we, we first talked about this. This is like, it's not all roses and sunshine in terms of just no. numbers and trends and where they're going. It's no first date on The Bachelor, if you will. Um, <laughs> no, sorry, I couldn't help myself. Uh, they're priced at between 11 and $13 a share. That's kind of the current range. It's about a $1.5 billion valuation. And that's, you know, as you'll note, $900 million less than the last private valuation. So they really start off at a discount here. And what they're doing is they're going out talking to investors trying to fill their book on the roadshow. And they may, we'll see, raise their uh, range before they go public. Some people say no. Some people say yes. I talked to a CEO yesterday who was like, no, they're not going to. I think they might. Um, and then they're going to hope for a really good first day pop in the stock market. So they're trying to be conservative. So how, you know, the, I think the pop is totally reasonable for them to expect that. But how bad in terms of just how they're probably current investors, how, how do they do you think they feel about having a down round at all? Like the last time, like I feel like in the bit larger investment community, we talked about down rounds. It was because Mark Andreessen had that tweet storm where he said, down rounds will happen and some companies will vaporize because of right. that. Right, right. I think Box is going to be okay. They have a lot of cash. Uh, they can afford this. And if you think about it this way, if you're like you know DFJ or one of these other firms put money in at a certain valuation, you own so many shares. And if Box sells their IPO shares at a slightly lower price but the stock goes up, you're kind of okay. You're not great. You would have preferred to start at 2.4 and gone to 2.8. But if they go 1.5 to 2, you're not really that far down. And if you believe in the company, as they do, then the certain share price will rise over time and you'll be okay. It's not beautiful. The market is not great right now. But Box is doing what I think is the fiscally appropriate thing. And um, if they went public at like $25 a share, they would get massacred. Yeah. So what's your option here? Yeah. They, they filed their S1, what, in like March, March 2014? Tw yeah. So. Yeah, so that was a long time ago. This has been a long <laughs> it's been process. 10-month death march for that company, man. <laughs> death they, march. They have, they have been through it. It's finally at the end of the tunnel, though. The light is there in their face. Aaron I'm Lemmy surprised to, to see them still talking here about you know going public. I could have sworn that they would have gotten snapped up in an acquisition by like Microsoft or something like this. Even though they're always you know talking badly about Microsoft, I thought that they would have gotten to this point and then it would have been like a really big M and A transaction. So I talked to maybe. Microsoft about that. Yeah, and they were like, eh. so I, uh, my biggest question is. Pricing, like games aside, yes. uh, the biggest metric for Box as a software as a service company is cost to acquire customers versus their lifetime value. Yes. How has that shifted? Um, it's They look OK. okay. Uh, I think the question is, how much can they work on uh, their two-year renewals as opposed to just acquiring new customers? Because if they have good contract growth over two years but then lose to OneDrive or Google Drive, they have a much higher, um, they have much lower LTV to their initial CAC or CAC. So that's my, that's really f arcane financial bullshit. But th the point is, their numbers are getting better over time. So hopefully, they'll improve to the point which they can actually reach real profitability. OK. Well, uh, next topic is some big changes over at Google Glass. Uh, a few things happened this week, Kyle. Yeah. You can take okay, the lead. Okay, so BBC got this scoop where basically uh, Google Glass is no longer going to be developed within uh, Google X, which is where they work on crazy moonshot projects at Google. What's a moonshot? Uh, so basically anything that isn't like a direct, like, oh, we make this profit, and then it goes out via our normal channels, and then like it's like self-driving cars, oh, things sure, that go to sure. space, right. things that are <laughs> new form So factors. literally a moonshot. Right. OK, fine. In some okay. cases. <laughs> Ominous. So, Taking it out of there, it's no longer going to be under the purview of Astro Teller. It'll be under Tony Fidel, who came over to Google via the acquisition of Nest right. last year, uh, who you know was one of the designers and developers of the iPod at Apple. Uh, so, like, big name has relative you know, like a lot of experience making things that could turn out awful actually be amazing. Yeah. Uh, they're also shutting down production of the Google Glass as it exists today. It's no longer going to be available on sale after January 19th. And they're shutting down the Explorer program, which is how Google's been gathering feedback for the last two years on it. How so are you guys taking this whole change. I mean, I think we actually have two different posts on TechCrunch.com right now, one of which is Google, Google Glass is not dead, and another one is like, It never why? had a chance. <laughs> yeah, never had a chance. Yeah, that Ron Miller post was tough. So, yeah. Uh, okay, so, uh, you know, there's two ways of taking it. Like, it's hot take season for Google Glass. Like, <laughs> yeah. you can say whatever the fuck the you want. Of hot and takes. like, you know, you could be right. And it really comes out to, how are you interpreting this? Is this Google's trying to save face, but like, wind down Google Glass and be like, ooh, that was an error? Or is this actually a transition to, OK, we got all the user feedback we needed for this beta version. We're going to keep iterating internally now and crank out an awesome consumer model. I hope it's two. I, I really do hope too. it's two. I think I think it was a bold, awesome move. It was a cool product. It just never really kind of gelled. That's okay. Keep doing crazy shit because I want Google Glass built into my glasses, like just just built in. And right. If they will build that for me, I will just give them so much money. And that's the like problem. Like nine dollars. Is they released a 
fairly functional beta version, but they didn't announce like the things that would reassure you, like, oh yeah, we're partnering with Luxottica and the brands that make Ray-Bans, you know, the glasses we all think are cool. Like they didn't announce that until everyone already like had the idea of glass holes in their head and like, oh, this thing's super clunky. But like well, Moore's it, it really Law is was. on Google's side. But you can't iterate hardware when it's already on my face. Is exactly, that too. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you think that that eventually this this whole augmented vision thing is is going to pan out, or it should pan out? Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. I think I think we'll have an HUD in all of our, our wall glasses in 15 years. It's gonna be awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe it was just a few core problems like design and the early adopters that they signed up to to use it, and maybe the fact that there was a camera on the device, which freaked some people out. Camera but. that didn't indicate whether or not you were That's filming, and also, they charged $1,500 to only early adopters. Only nerds were buying it, and people are afraid of nerds, um, because they, like, they will do anything. So like, then the who knows what the nerds could do with this? The next version will therefore be the revenge of the nerds, I think. Right, right. That's like the story of TechCrunch, really, in, yeah. in a nutshell. But um, great, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you for watching, and have a good weekend.